So the Irish men's team in action tonight. But on Tuesday, the Irish women's team were playing Greece in a European Championship qualifier and succumbed to a 93rd minute equaliser against the Greeks. Ireland really should have won the game. Amber Barrett, the goal scorer for Ireland on 13 minutes with a beautiful chipped goal, is on the line. Evening, Amber. Good evening. So... This, it feels, from listening to all the post-match interviews, that everyone within the camp realised this was a real missed opportunity? It was, yeah. Um, I think a few of us were talking after it. It's nearly, it's nearly different when, you know, you go out and you play a game and, you know, you know from early on that, you know, it's a game that you're going to struggle with and that you're not going to win. And I think that we were, we got into, as soon as we got the 1-0, I think we realised that, you know, this can go one of two ways. You know, we could really kick on and, I think we knew from early on that they were going to be difficult. Mm. Um, but I think conceding, conceding one at the nice third minute is it's, uh, it's still it's still very very hard to take. Um, but I think we have to learn from that. And if we're really really serious about qualifying for the you know the Euro Championships, you know we, we can't be letting these these types of results you know um, go against us. You know, but we're still still not the end of the world, of course. Yeah, it is difficult to analyse because I guess the great tradition of Irish football is that when we take the lead, we find ourselves sitting back, inviting teams on and running the risk of conceding a very late equaliser as happened. But at the same time, like, in the first half, it didn't feel as though that's what happened, that actually Ireland created a huge amount of chances, really should have had the game put to bed before Greece managed to really get themselves together in the second half. Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, in the first half, especially, I thought we didn't do. We weren't. Um, we I didn't think we did too bad, and that we had created a few, you know, a few very, very good chances. That um, unfortunately, in, in international football, when you don't take the chances that you get, um, a lot of the time you are punished, and that's exactly what happened to us. Um, but as you said yourself, I do, I do feel that if we, even if we'd have got, you know, a second goal, I don't think they were going to come back from two 0 down at any stage to threaten us. I think the fact it stayed one 0 for so long that. They just had that continued hope the whole second half, especially. Um, us dropping off, you know, going a little bit deeper didn't help it as well. As you said, you know, Irish teams tend to invite pressure, but, you know, that's something that we are certainly not used to doing. Mm. Um, usually, you know, we're quite we're quite organised and quite, you know, help go out from the front kind of job. But it's, um, I suppose, with pressure, pressure games, pressure situations, you know, um, these little things happen, you know. And as you said, we are disappointed, but it's, you know, it's, it's certainly not broken us anyway. Yeah, and look, I think after a performance like that, it, there's always a, a temptation in a way to be patronising and go, well, look, at these are learning experiences and you move on and you take from it and over the coming years you'll benefit. But like this is a European Championship campaign that started so well. There's such a huge opportunity. It feels as though the players are very much aware of what an opportunity that game was, that actually it's not about there's always a bit of learning and picking things up but actually these games right now are massively important and games you feel you should be delivering in yeah I completely agree and you know I think at the start of the campaign if you had said by Christmas time you know we would have had seven points mm. considering we were going to be playing a second seed team um, although yes of course it was at home you still I think would have taken the seven points uh, I think the fact that the drop points has come against Greece who you know their fourth season they're a team that you know we would have looked at and said not that we would have fancied ourselves, but we would have been quite confident that we would have been able to pick up three points. And it's unfortunate that we weren't able to do it. But at the same time, it, you know, you said it could be slightly patronising, but I, I don't think it is in any, you know, any of the slightest idea that we do have to learn from this. And we know now going in when we come back and play Greece at home in March that we know that they're going to throw absolutely everything into us. And we know ourselves that we're going to have to put the game to bed and we're going to have to be really really strong for 95 96 minutes to make sure that we get the result because we know that they they won't lie down and you know maybe we i don't think we we underestimated them at all but i do think that you know when you give them a chance to stay in the game we have to make sure that we eradicate that for the next game and know that that um we're taking the three points when they call when they come to ireland in march it's still very early in Vera Pau's reign as the new Republic of Ireland manager and everyone's trying to figure out exactly what her style will be because it did feel, watching the last day, there was a lot of Route 1 football and there's always a, a sense in this country, maybe we pay them too much respect, that when coaches come in from the outside, it's going to be a lot more about getting the ball down, playing it around. Like, Did you feel on Tuesday you executed the game plan to the way you wanted and the way Vera wanted? No, because the whole week we had building to having having the ball firstly and I think that 
our biggest problem on Tuesday was that we give away the ball so cheaply at times and uh, I, I especially in the second half was, was you know very very guilty of it just giving away a ball under a lot sometimes even very very little pressure and you know they had set us out from the start of the week that you know we were going to control the game we were going to move them and um, I think that just it just didn't happen and I, I, you know it's, it's very very hard to put you know put a finger on it and Nobody is to blame for it. You know, this is the way mm. football goes sometimes. And you, you know, you plan for you plan for ten days of this game plan, and this is what's going to happen, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. But after five minutes, it can go completely out the window. And I think, you know, after we scored, I think then it just it just got a little bit scrappy for us. And you know, they were extremely extremely physical. And you know, I think there was a few of the tackles that went in were very very heavy. Um, I think especially the one underneath um, was an extremely heavy challenge. And I think little things like that there um, are also something that you do plan for, but then, you know, to the extent you don't obviously expect it. But I think we were planning on having the ball and, you know, doing our best to control it. And even when Vera spoke after the game, that's the one thing she said to us was that we need to learn how to control the, control the game much better. And um, again, it's something we're going to have to work really, really hard at between now and the next game. And, for any other game in the camp, you know, it's not just about Greece for Montenegro away, Ukraine away, Germany home and away. There are going to be games that we are going to need to make sure that we are fully fully in the fight. It, that's an extremely difficult thing to do, what you're talking about there. Like, you're, when you mentioned a lot of players, yourself included, giving the ball away cheaply at times, and it's, I'm sure personally it's so frustrating, that if you do want to have a different style of play where you are comfortable in possession of the ball, playing the game at your own pace, to be able to get to that level, do you feel it's something that can happen quite quickly, that actually getting a few training sessions, watching the videos, realising the errors, it's a quick fix, or is this something that actually, it is a learning curve, that this is something that this group is going to take three or four years and building up experience, that you can get to that sort of level? Well, I do think that, you know, I think if you look at um, the last game we played against Ukraine, I think that is certainly a game that we we certainly dominated and we certainly controlled. Um, I thought our ball distribution against Ukraine was, was 10 times better than it was against Greece. And yes, it's not something you click your fingers and this happens overnight. But at the same time, there's a lot, a lot of top quality players in our team that are well capable of, you know, controlling the ball and controlling possession. And I think that it was just, it was really human error that we, um, on Tuesday against Greece, because I know myself that, there's some of the instances I give the ball away, and I know if I if I tried those in- instances tonight of training, that ten times nine times out of ten I won't give the ball away. Mm. Um, it's just that little bit of pressure is added on top of it, but it's certainly something that I think for the last two or three years we have certainly got a lot better at, and I think with Sarah as well, it is only going to get better. And it look, it's Tuesday was you know it was obviously disappointing to concede so late on, but it's definitely not the end of the world for us, and you know it is a learning curve curve and we have to be we have to be smarter especially for the next um the next few games are going to be the toughest games we'll have yeah, the situation in the group is that Ireland, second in the group, seven points, behind Germany on 12 points. The next game is at home to Greece. It's not until March. Germany are one of the best teams in the world, very much expected to top the group. There are automatic spots for the three best runners-up at the European Championships in England next year. The other six will go into a playoff. So still in a very good position to, at the very least, get a playoff with the possibility, I guess, of probably winning the remaining games that you have against Greece, Montenegro, Ukraine, and maybe somehow snatching something against Germany somewhere along the line, is is that what the plan is? Yeah, well, I think every single game we go out, you know, we're, we're looking to win the game, and it doesn't matter who we play. Um, obviously, you're looking at somebody with the, the size and magnitude of Germany, and, you know, we've watched them very carefully over the last few months with clips when, when you know, analysing their own opposition that... Um, Ukraine and Montenegro had each played Germany when we run the run on run into them games. So we, you know, we were taking a careful look at obviously Ukraine and Montenegro more so. But at the same time, you can't you know ignore the quality that Germany have. It's obviously going to be an extremely difficult task to get something out of the Germany games. But that is one thing that we pride ourselves on. We make it really really difficult for teams, um, regardless of the quality, to get results out of us. So, you know, we're definitely something that will will be difficult for us and certainly something we'll look forward to but at the same time you know we have we have Greece and Montenegro on a double header now um in March and it's, it's that's all our focus is on and even to be honest you know Montenegro hasn't really crossed our sights yet we have Greece first and then we'll worry about Montenegro and those games then eventually against Germany 
you know German football well. You're playing your club football in Germany at the moment with Cologne. And in every sport, Germany and Ireland, there's always going to be a giant killing element, you feel, when Ireland go up against Germany. When you look at where German football is, like, is it simply a weight of numbers that they are one of the best teams in the world right now? It feels maybe a slight step ahead of Ireland. Or when you have looked at German football in your time there, are they doing things differently that we can learn a lot from? Well, I think the main thing, the main difference between Ireland and, and football in Germany is that it's, it's professional here. Um, and that, that makes a huge, huge difference to any any country and any club. And the fact that I, you know, I'm very, very lucky to have, to have moved to Cologne during the summer. And, you know, I've been exposed now to eight or nine training sessions a week uh, in comparison to two, max three in Ireland. And, you know, if you're looking at that, you have nine sessions compared to three. Mm. There is only gonna, ever going to be one outcome. You know, Katie Taylor is never going to win any of her fights if she's only training three times a week. So it, it doesn't matter where in the world you are. You know, I think that the German players are, a lot of them are more exposed to that professional environment. And I think the Irish players are growing all the time. And there's definitely, there's definitely loads of opportunity for Irish players to go away. Um, in terms of the Irish league and in comparison to the German league, I think that's, you know, I think the size and magnitude, obviously, financially, it's very, very difficult to compete. To compete. Um, but that's something that Irish football is going to have to do because that will also help bridging the gap in international level. And, you know, it will make it a lot easier for for our teams to qualify and compete against the best teams, you know, when the, you know, when the structure is there underneath them to support. It's probably difficult enough for you to talk about the Irish League because many of your international teammates are still playing in the Irish League, but you have an awful lot of experience of it from your time with P Mount United. It does feel from the way you're talking as if we're a world away from getting anywhere near where German football is. I think collectively as the league is, um, I, th- I just think financially there is not enough support there coming. And it is, it's extremely, extremely hard. Um, one of the biggest factors is, I, no, I don't know what it is in 2019, but I'm fairly sure it's, it's, it's close enough that in, I think it was 2017, there was over a million girls in Germany registered to play football. Mm. And in Ireland, there was just short of 21,000. So that itself is, is a huge, you know, it's, it's an absolute, it's a massive gap. And it's a, it's a huge statistic that you're trying to come, you know, you're, you're trying to compete with these teams who, you know, have what, 980,000 more, <laughs> more people to, to choose from. So, like, it's and when you compare those those type of things, it's now I, I I was a big fan of the league when I was there, and I'm a big fan of a lot of the players that are in the league. There is certainly a lot of players in the teams in the league that are more than capable of going away and playing um, professional football, whether it be in Germany, whether it be in England, whether it be in France or wherever. Um, I've absolutely no doubt about it because I know from my own experiences and I know from looking at the the senior team now, yes, there isn't that many players that are currently involved in the Irish League, but mm. every single player in Ireland, maybe by a couple of the girls from, um, from abroad, have all played through the Irish League. So, you know, I have absolutely no doubt that the Irish players are capable of doing better. I think that... Um, The league has obviously, it has developed, but I think it needs to keep developing for it to compete um, at the top level. Uh, Where do you think we are in terms of improving our development? Because I think you're well placed in that. I think before you went over to Germany, you were uh, training to be a school teacher. And also, you've come through from Donegal. So understanding the difficulties it was, I guess, probably to play football at a young age in Donegal in terms of numbers, in terms of getting clubs together and things like that, to being able to go and become a full-time professional with a team in Germany and playing for the Republic of Ireland. Like, do you think opportunities are there for young girls in Ireland? Are we making enough opportunities for them? Well, I can be honest with you, and since even I left Donegal to go to Dublin to play, there's definitely been a lot more teams and um, women's teams in Donegal that have, have you know, have have started and are, you know, are really building. And even my local club um, didn't have a women's team for years, and now they have an underage structure there. And you know, their aspirations is that they want to go on to develop a women's team, and to have that in place now is, you know, is is great because I didn't really have that when I was there. Um, of course, there was local teams that I could play with, but mm. um, I played my my women's football in Donegal with Lag and Harp, which it's not obviously not in any way far away from me, but it wasn't my local local town. Um, I think that we're it is building in that sense that you even you look at Beginner Cup, 
um, how much it has grown over the last couple of years. I think now they're nearly splitting it into um, two or three weekends now to facilitate the numbers that are, you know, going down. So it's looking at those things, it's definitely it's definitely saying that things are improving and they're going to keep improving because I think the demand and the interest in women's football in Ireland, you know, has completely, it's skyrocketed in the last couple of years and those little things will help. And I know that the FA are going to do their best then to facilitate and obviously to develop as well. Um, so in that case, it, look, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's definitely, it, there's, I can definitely see an improvement there. The, the obvious question when you talk about some of the hurdles there, maybe you face that your local club didn't have a, a girls team when you were growing up and you had to go down the road a little bit, that there were some obstacles that you had to overcome to make it at those early stages and then you got to move up to Dublin to try and progress again. How did you become so good? What was it along your path when you were a kid that you ended up being one of the best players in the country? Was there driving forces there? Was it just this burning desire inside you that you were going to make it no matter what? Or how did it all come about? Honestly, I think I was very lucky that I had, um, well, still do. My parents are extremely supportive of everything I do. But uh, to be honest with you, it was just practice. I was always I was always playing football. Even if it was in the garden with my brother, we were always we were always kicking ball and those things, that's all it's about. Even though I wasn't, you know, at times exposed to a lot of maybe matches and football training, but I always had a ball at my feet and I was always practicing. And, th- and those things, even, you know, even if you aren't playing two or three matches a week, if you're if you're practicing all the time, these things, they don't leave you. So I was very, very lucky with that. I played in good uh, in good teams in school um, and obviously played with Lagan as well, which all, that always, always helped. But... As you know, I played a lot of GAA at the mm. same time, so I don't think there was this... Always in the back of my mind, there was an interest to obviously play um, football at a high level. And I think when you see the likes of players that you grew up with, um, you know, played at international underage, with, had went on and become professional, you were kind of sitting there going, Jesus, you know, why can I not do that? So um, I think it wasn't until I gave up to GAA that I realised that this could be really, really possible, you know, if I really dedicated myself to something and... Thankfully, it has so far worked out. You know, I am playing professional football. And I'm very lucky to do so. Um, but at the same time, I've you know I have a lot, a lot of work to catch up on as well. So um, I'm going to enjoy that bit as well. Yeah. How did giving up the GA go down at home? Is it your dad who's very much involved with the Donegal under twenties? Uh, he is, and my bro- my older brother, he's in the manager of the Donegal under seventeen. Right. So. Um, it's very uh, well. My uh, my younger brother refers to it as the foreign sport, so uh, <laughs> he doesn't really. Um, I don't think he's a big fan, but they're, they're, too, they're all very very supportive of me, and they know it wasn't an easy decision. But I think you know moments like Tuesday, um, scoring for your country. You know they see they see the the amount of effort that I put in, the dedication, and you know every every person in sport that has been in any way successful has made sacrifice. Um, so I'd like to think that was my that was t- yeah. that was one of my sacrifices. And you're obviously still very young, you're only 23, but when you are over there now in Cologne and you talk about those eight, nine training sessions a week compared to the three sessions you would have been used to and what you've seen coming up through the system, is any part of you, I don't want to use, like, bitter is over-exaggerating it, but is any part of you thinking, oh, oh God, I wish I did have these opportunities from when I was 14, 15? Um, No, because I think one of the reasons why I'm so... I'm so happy about it and I have absolutely no regrets. And I've always said this, I, abs- I regret absolutely nothing I've done because I think every moment that I've chosen to stay away until this moment has, you know, paved the way for me. Um, you know, I was very lucky to be in a, to have been in a very, very good um, college initially with Manus and had a very, very good soccer program there. And, you know, I had absolutely fantastic life experiences there where it be, yeah, socially or football wise and I think those things shaped me as well um obviously then recently I graduated from DC with my master's and that certainly you know I had five years in college and was very very lucky to do so and I have absolutely no regrets about any of those things because those things have you know they've enabled me to do this and they've also matured me and you know taught me valuable life lessons I think and as you said I'm only 23 but I still think that you know without doing what I've done up to this point none of this would have been possible and you know, I'm very, very lucky still where I am. And, you know, I think that lucky is going to be the word I'll use for the rest of my life because I am very, very lucky to be in this position. But um, absolutely no regrets to any of these moments anyway. You're uh, you're heading off to training, I know. Um, 
but you only moved over in the summer, so you're still finding your way at Cologne and you've been making appearances off the bench. Has the manager been watching the international games? Have they seen the goal against Greece and the quality that's there? You think it'll force you into the starting lineup this weekend? Well, I'll find out tonight when I see him, and if he doesn't have it all saved on my phone anyway, <laughs> so I can show him when I get there. All right, Amber, great stuff. Thanks a lot for taking the call. No bother at all. Thank you very much.